This video looks at the idea of a tangent space at an arbitrary point to any given manifold in which vectors exist. It shows how vectors expressed as directional derivatives form a basis for the tangent space at the given point. This basis has the same dimension as a given manifold. So this comment here, the tangent space, is, in, is the space in which vectors exist. All right, let's say we have some curve in blue here, in n-dimensional Euclidean space described by the vector x parameterized in terms of the coordinates parameterized in terms of variable lambda, x of lambda, xn, n being the dimension of the space. At some point p on this curve, we also have a tangent vector shown in red, this bit here. Now, just as the curve exists in n-dimensional Euclidean space, so does the tangent vector to the curve at any point p. So any point on this curve here, the tangent vector, it also exists in Euclidean space. And so what's important here in this picture is that the curve exists in n-dimensional Euclidean space. For example, it could be two space, it would just x and y here, and we're in two-dimensional space. But so does the tangent vector, it also exists in n-dimensional space, or if we're a two-dimensional example, such as x and y on these axes here, then this red vector here, representing the tangent vector, would also exist in two-dimensional space. So both the uh, original curve and the vector both live in n-dimensional Euclidean space. So in this case, the tangent space is n-dimensional Euclidean space. Well, what is meant by the tangent space to a curved manifold? A manifold that's not flat. So the tangent vector shown on this manifold below touches the manifold at a single point P. So what is the tangent space here? Because the only point of contact between the tangent vector and the curve is at one point P. This vector here doesn't exist on the manifold. So what is the tangent space here for a curved manifold? Alright, well given any point P on some n-dimensional manifold, then local to that point, the manifold is homeomorphic to n-dimensional Euclidean space. So take an arbitrary point P on any manifold, and around that point, at that point, and around that point, the manifold looks roughly flat like Euclidean space. So there's a mapping from that point P and the surrounding area, the surrounding small region around it, the local region to that point, that can be mapped to Euclidean space, and that's the whole point of manifolds, that's not behind, lies behind the definition of manifolds. Now the tangent vector to that point T will be given by red T here, is this expansion here for n-dimensional space. Now the only thing with um, uh, vectors is that the components are not invariant under coordinate transformations. So for example, if you rotate the axes in n-dimensional space, you can end up producing a tangent vector with the components T dash, rotated space as mod t, that's the absolute value of this here, magnitude of this here, this vector, and all the other components zero. So coordinates are not invariant, and they're not a good idea for um, uh, uh, talking about transformations and vectors and so on. A coordinate invariant or coordinate independent approach involves the direction of, of vectors, and that involves the use of directional derivatives, because what is invariant with a vector is direction and magnitude, not the components. So let's pursue this directional derivative idea. So at any point p on the curve, the directional derivative of some scalar function f is given by df d lambda is df dxi times dxi d lambda. This part here will turn out to be the tangent vector. This gives the rate of change of f in the direction of the tangent vector to the curve and can be written as df d lambda as dxi d lambda df dxi. Or these are the components of the tangent vector here, ti, df, dxi. Now, but this scalar function f is entirely arbitrary, and so we can write the directional derivative operator in the form d, d lambda is ti times d, dxi. And that can operate on some scalar function f, whatever it be. So here's our directional derivative operator. And that will play a key role in the rest of the video. 
All right, in Euclidean space, we can represent vectors as linear combinations of the basis vectors EI. So some combination of basis vectors gives us our vector in Euclidean space. Now these vectors are defined so as to point in the direction of increasing Xi, that is these basis vectors. But this directional derivative operator, d d lambda, contains the components of the tangent vector, that's the Ti part we saw earlier, and a set of partial derivative operators, d d Xi, that point in the same directions as the basis vectors EI. We'll see a picture of this shortly. Now this operator, dd lambda, contains the same information as the tangent vector t equals t uh, contravariant i times e covariant basis i. This means we can identify the basis vectors ei with the partial derivative operators ddxi. That also means that we can identify any vector v equals vi as superscript i as components contravariant components times its covariant basis vectors as a directional derivative by rewriting it in the form vi ddxi. Now further to this we can use the partial derivative operators ddxi as a set of coordinate basis vectors just like the ei. So here's a picture here, here's some vector um, in let's say two dimensional space, an example from some point p and it has x component, y component, so you have basis vector in the x direction, basis vector in the y direction if you like, or x1, x2. And But also notice that df dxi is how f changes in the direction of x1, which is in this direction. Alright, so let's define the tangent vector as the directional derivative operator. So this will be our tangent vector as ti dxi. And we'll also define it as a real valued map on the algebra of differentiable functions. That's the class at the point P, the little subscript means point P, so it's a class of differentiable functions and the infinity meaning infinitely many times differentiable. So C infinity at the point P. At the arbitrary point P on some manifold, so T subscript P, that's the tangent vector at P, is a mapping from this differentiable, this class of differentiable or infinitely many times differentiable functions at the point P from Rn into R, so from n-dimensional space into the real number line. Then given the functions f, g, some scalar functions f, g, and real numbers, just uh, constants a, b, we see that this operator is linear on the vector space, made up this class of infinitely many times differentiable functions, or c infinity at the point P, and just see that t subscript p acting on this constant times the scalar f plus this constant times the scalar g expands out in a linear way. The product rule for differentiation or Leibniz rule applies here, so the tangent vector as we've defined it here as a differential operator, directional derivative operator of this product here of the two scalar functions expands out this way. And again we're talking subscript p means at p, so f is evaluated at p, g is evaluated at p. So the product rule or the Leibniz rule applies here. Alright, now, a tangent vector at the point P, T subscript P at any point P of a differentiable manifold M, is a linear map from the algebra of differentiable functions at P to the real numbers. So here we go, tangent vector at P is the um, C infinity class of differentiable functions at P on M, um, mapped to the real numbers. So the set of tangent vectors of P form a vector space, T subscript P of M. So this will be the tangent space on the manifold, M for the manifold, since any linear combination of tangent vectors of P is also a tangent vector of P. So an example here, you have T subscript P is one tangent vector, V subscript P is another tangent vector, and we have here a linear combination of them, constants A and B again, um, acting on this scalar function, and that just distributes across. So again, linearity. All right, the tangent space of P is designated T subscript P of M, M being the manifold. Individual tangent vectors can be represented as T subscript P as sigma I equals 1 to N, N dimensions of the, of the manifold. T I, D, D, X, I are evaluated at the point P, or just simply T I, D, D, X, I getting rid of the sigma notation, just compactifying the notation, making it more explicit, direct, simpler evaluated at P, because remember this is always going to be at P, the point P is key to this um, whole video and its argument throughout. 
So throughout the entire video, point P is crucial. This point P on the manifold is arbitrary. Alright, so how does this apply on a manifold? So here's a, a manifold. Just This is just an example representative of all manifolds, but it's just easy to visualize the surface of a sphere, which is a manifold, so we'll use that as our example, but representative of all manifolds. On that manifold, we have an open set U, alpha. Here we go, the open set in blue there. We have two points, P and Q. Alright, and U subscript alpha is just our particular open set. We know that for a manifold, um, there is a mapping from the uh, set U alpha to Euclidean space. There is a chart uh, which is involves the open set U alpha, a map phi, and the map phi maps from the open interval to the set V in Euclidean space. So this open interval containing P and Q here is mapped to the open set. I should say the open set on the manifold U subscript alpha is mapped to the open set in Euclidean space V subscript alpha. And this open set U along with this map phi forms a chart. Now let some function F be defined on this manifold, some scalar function F that maps the manifold to the real numbers. It's a smooth function on M, the manifold, and let U alpha phi alpha be a chart of some atlas with U alpha contained in the domain of F. So this set U alpha, the open set U, is contained within the domain of this scalar function F. Um, then F hat, this one here, because just as F is defined on the manifold here, when this is mapped over, what does F become over here in Euclidean space? Well, what it becomes we will call F hat. So F and F hat are related. So F hat is F composed of phi inverse, that's the inverse map from this to here, which takes us back to U, and U is the domain. F then maps that to the reals. Or another way is that the map phi subscript alpha of the set U alpha is mapped to the reals. It maps this to the reals. Right. It's a real value function on Rn. And f is said to be class C infinity if f hat is class C infinity. Okay, so just once again, f is defined on the manifold here, some scalar function. Its domain includes the set u alpha here. And under this map here, phi alpha, we create or induce f hat in Euclidean space here. Under this map, point p goes to phi alpha of p. Point Q goes to phi alpha of Q. Alright, now set the coordinates of P to be phi alpha of P, so that's the point P under the map phi alpha, and we'll let that call that A uh, superscript I, and that has the coordinates A1 to AN, depending on the dimension of the manifold, and let XI be the point Q under the map phi alpha, and be a point contained within some, and this point here, XI, um, phi alpha of Q, will be a point contained within some open ball of radius mod A, I, contained within phi alpha of U alpha. So in the open set V, we saw on the previous page, this A, I is contained within that. Hence, in a neighbourhood of A, I, we can express F hat according to Hadamard, from Hadamard's lemma, and that's in a separate video to this one. We can write it as F hat of X, I minus F hat of A, I, equals X, I, minus A, I, times F hat of I, X, I. All right. Or just expand that out, so just rewrite that, expanding out the brackets here, same line here. Alright, next step, what we want to do now, so here we are, F hat is in Euclidean space. Just remember that, it's in Euclidean space. Okay, it's what F on the manifold, the scalar function F on the manifold, looks like when it's mapped under this mapping, phi alpha, into Euclidean space. And this gives us F hat. Now, differentiate this with respect to the coordinate functions, x, j. And the coordinate functions are what we get in the set V under the mapping phi. Phi alpha, that is. All right, well, let's differentiate this whole thing through by dxj. All of that, that's the left-hand side there. This one here, this one here, this one here. Okay, and this one here. All right, now some terms will drop out. Um, here on the left, 
this is a constant, it's a fixed point AI. So the derivative of that thing, the scalar value at a fixed point will be a scalar, the derivative of that will be zero, they'll drop off. This one here, the derivative of a scalar, that will drop off, and we're left with this first term, this one, this one, and this one. So we'll write that down here. Now you notice here dxi dxj, well that's Kronecker delta applies there. So here we are, Kronecker delta. Next, next line down. Now that so the i's are summed out become j. So that's contracted become j here, fj. And <clears throat> we have this object here equal to this. Alright, now let's rewrite this, just factorize out this common term here, and we can finally get this line here. Okay, this one, that one, right. Now, what happens when xi, the point Q, approaches ai, uh, the point P? And we get, when that happens, this approaches this, this bit drops out, because as this approaches that, this goes to zero, so all that drops out, and this xi goes to ai. So we get this object here, and that's going to be very useful later on. Now, we've seen that in a previous video from Hadamard, so I'm just reminding you of that here. The previous video was called Hadamard's Lemma. All right, now, xi equals xi of phi alpha of q. It's a point q under the mapping phi alpha. And ai is the point p under the mapping phi alpha. Okay, so notation there. And also we have f hat is f composed of phi alpha inverse. And if we then, to both sides of that, if we then compose that with phi alpha, so f hat composed of phi alpha gives us f composed of phi alpha inverse composed of phi alpha gives us f. So we have in Euclidean space f hat according to Hadamard, and on the manifold fq is fp plus xi minus ai equals fj of q, and we also have from the previous page fj of p equals dj f of p. Now you remember the point ai was the point p. So all this from the previous page gives us this result here, which is very, very handy. And will prove to be very handy. Alright, now as xi approaches ai, we also have q approaches p. So in Euclidean space, xi is approaching ai. On the manifold, q is approaching p. So the fj of p equals dj fp, as we saw on the previous page. Page. But fj of p coincides with fj of ai, f hat, sorry, that is, since the functions f and f hat coincide at the point p. That's important to remember because you, that, the set v there in Euclidean space and the manifold, they touch at the one point, and that is the point p. That's what this whole video is about, point what happens around point p. So just at that point, f and f hat coincide. So that means we have things like fj of p, it was dj f hat of ai integral 0 to 1 dt. Now this bit here comes from Hadamard's lemma, and you can see it on the previous video, but obviously when you evaluate that, that uh, uh, definite integral here, you're going to get 1, and we'll be left with just this object here. All right. Now, so the vectors d, d, x, j, evaluate the point p, acting on the scalar f, span the tangent space, T subscript P of M. So the tangent space of the point P is spanned by these because at the point P, F hat and F touch. They share the same value just at that one point. So what's true for one, F hat, will be true for F as well. Vice versa, what's true for F will be true for F hat. So we can say that these vectors here span the tangent space, which is a good thing. All right, now, Going back to our chart, if u alpha phi alpha is any chart on m at the point p with coordinate functions xi, remember xi is what you get in the Euclidean space there, uh, then the operators d, d, xi evaluated at p are a map, so the operators evaluated at p are a map from the class of many times or infinitely number of times differentiable functions at the point p on the manifold to the reals, where d, d, xi evaluated p of f, this is the, on the manifold, is equal to this object here, f hat, in Euclidean space, evaluate the point xi equals the point p under the mapping phi alpha. Remember, at the point p, very special, f on the manifold, f in the Euclidean space, at that one point they share the same value. At the point p, both f and f hat have the same value, where the manifold space and tangent space 
share the same point. Important there. A picture of that, here we go, is just some manifold. Here's our tangent plane, two dimensional manifolds. We expect a two dimensional tangent plane. Here's our tangent vector. Now, this on the manifold, so ddxi of the scalar function f defined on the manifold at point p will be equal to this thing in the Euclidean space also at the point p or in Euclidean space it's xi equals the point p under the map phi alpha so the image of the point p under the map phi alpha is xi evaluate this thing at xi is the same as evaluating this at the point p and they're both the same point there the one point with this tangent plane tangent space touches the manifold space all right, so a theorem. If u alpha phi alpha is a chart on a manifold M with P, the point P belongs to the manifold, then the operator given by Ti ddxi, evaluated at the point P, form a basis for the tangent space at the point P, T subscript P of M, with this dimension being N equals dimension M. So proof of that is let the tangent vector at P be, let Tp be a tangent vector at the point P, so that Tp is defined this way. T, tj ddxj evaluate the point p and given any scalar function f that's a constant so some sort of constant then this tangent vector acting on that constant well ddxj of a constant will be zero so this whole thing goes to zero all right now so we can get zero all right now from hadamard's lemma and with the points xi equals xi of the point q under the map phi alpha and AI equals the point P under the map phi alpha, XI. We have in the Euclidean space this expression, and on the manifold for the points P and Q, this expression. And we also have, as we found earlier, this expression here, this equation here, I should say. This equation from uh, for F on the manifold, according to Hadamard, and in Euclidean space, this equation here. I should be calling equations on expressions. All right, now, let's take Hadamard's equation on the manifold for the scalar function f at point q and let the tangent vector act on that, the tangent operator act on that. So we expand it out, so we're going to have here, tp here, tp of this object times that, plus these brackets here, this factor here, times Tp acting on Fq. Alright, now let's assume that P is fixed. Alright, so on the left we've still got Tp F of Q. Here on the right we've got this bit here. If, it, if this is now fixed then this has a scalar value and Tp acting on a scalar or on a constant as we saw is zero so that drops out and we're left with, we'll expand this out, Tp Xi F of Q minus Tp Ai F of Q then this bit in brackets times Tp f of q. Now if you notice here, this is a constant, so we expect this to drop out as well. So here we are, which it has, and we now have T subscript P f of q is this object here. Now, as q approaches P on the manifold, because remember we are interested in point P, then in the Euclidean space, the, under the map phi alpha, xi approaches ai, or, or the difference between xi and ai goes to zero, which means this bit's going to drop out, and we're left with tp f of p now, because q is gone, we're going to the point p now, so at the point p is this object here at the point p, here it is, here it is there, and from earlier we found that this could be replaced with this, all right, now let's replace tp with in its operator form and see what the operator does in this last line here. So Tp acting on f of p is Tj ddxj evaluated at p, xi ddi f of p, and the chronica delta will apply to the xi and xj here. Here we go. That gives us a chronica delta. So the j gets summed out and we end up with i, Ti di f of p, which we can expand it out, Ti df of p at dxi. So we've created, so this tangent, uh, this operator here, di directional derivative operator here, this vector, the tangent vector acting on this scalar function gives us this vector here. 
Now, to show that these operators form a basis, uh, we need to establish that they are linearly independent. So we require this situation here where these coefficients times these basis vectors at the point P all sum to zero for whatever space we're in. So for some tangent vector where we want all the, the A, the T the superscript J to equal to zero, we need this to work out. Now, but at the point P, the action is operate on the coordinate functions, F equals XI equals the point P under the map phi alpha is, so let's see how we, that operates now. So imagine we have some, as we've already seen, it's possible to have a tangent vector that is zero at some point. Maybe the scalar function is constant on the manifold at that point, so the derivative there is zero. So we get zero equals tj ddxj evaluate the p, x, well, Kronecker delta applies here, and we see tj delta, so the j sum out, we end up with ti, and the whole thing, all the ti are equal to zero, just as we required. Remember for linear independence of vectors, the coefficients must all equal zero for all of them. All right, this shows that the operators tp is tj ddxj, the point P form a basis for the tangent space TP. They're linear independent. They span the base. Uh, the base. They span the space, I should say. Finally, as I runs from one to n, we have the dimension of this tangent space at P is equal to the dimension of M, the manifold. So the tangent space has the same dimension as the manifold. Since all vectors can be represented as directional derivatives in the form V equals V I E I, contravariant and covariant here, then we can write V I contravariant i, d d x i here, then we can say that the vectors exist in a tangent space to a manifold at some p, at some point p. So we can say that all vectors act on the, uh, formed on a manifold exist in a tangent space to the point p or whichever, whatever that point is, p being arbitrary. All right, now picture this if you look in two dimensions here, the two-dimensional manifold, just the surface of this curved surface here, we have some curve here at the point P on that curve there. This vector, which might be a velocity vector, this might be the particle, this might be a path the particle follows on some two-dimensional uh, surface. And its speed, its velocity, uh, it will be tangent to that curve. And that is this tangent vector here. And you can see this is a two-dimensional plane. The manifold here, the manifold surface is two-dimensional. So the we have a two-dimensional plane here, and the vector lives, tangent vector lives in that space. So curved manifolds also have a Euclidean uh, tangent space of the same dimension. And that's it.